thanks very much. Uh, when, when Chris asked me to come along and, uh, and speak about uh, um, becoming a wireless ISP, um, he said, could I do something along the lines of <clears throat> uh, 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 the shoestring talks that we've had in the past? And then there was a bit of a PS to his email that said, that might be taken as an insult, but please don't take it as one, um, because it's actually true. I do run a wireless ISP, pretty much on a shoestring, actually. So the customers don't care as long as the cat videos are available. So after about 20 years in type approvals at Motorola, uh, and I did a bit of fluffy marketing uh, at some points as well, and we did, uh, I did quite a lot of testing in the later days on asterisk-based telephone systems, um, we saw the writing on the wall at Motorola as it kind of went downhill, and uh, I planned my exit. Um, and I planned to start a VoIP business, uh, which I did, and uh, we got quite a few customers going, and uh, focusing mainly on small businesses, charities, churches, and, and such like. I never had any ambitions ever to run an ISP, and I underline the word ever. It just wasn't on my radar screen. So... Um, as a result of starting this new VoIP business, um, I realised how bad the internet was in Basingstoke. Uh, I live in a mid-1990s housing estate on the outskirts of Basingstoke. Uh, that's the town centre, slap bang in the middle, and all the, uh, the houses uh, were kind of in the outskirts. And one of the problems was that, um, although I was part of a Basingstoke broadband campaign, um, no matter how much you huff and puff at BT, you can't change the laws of physics. So what we had to do was something different. Anyway, um, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, another friend of mine um, called Dave, who lived about 500 metres away from me, uh, was one of the first people to get fibre to the cabinet. Um, so I, I, ha I hatched a plan in my mind as to how I was going to avail myself of this new feature that BT was rolling out. Um, so I took out the binoculars and I took out Google Maps and we came to the conclusion that we actually did have good line of sight to each other's houses. So I bought some cheap 5 gigahertz wireless kit. We spent a, an afternoon putting them on the roofs of our houses and lo and behold, the link actually leapt into life. Now, initially, I wanted to see how this link performed because after 20 years at Motorola doubling with radio, I was very sceptical of anything to do with wireless telegraphy. So uh, um, we um, started off by using iPerf between the, uh, between the two antennas. Uh, a neighbour of mine called John helped me out with a couple of spare laptops he had lying around, and we ran iPerf back and forward and we came to the conclusion this link might actually be stable. And it was. Uh, it actually worked. So uh, I connected up, uh, I uh, grasped the nettle, as we say, and ordered a, an FTTC line from Andrews and Arnold, uh, connected my uh, router at my house to the, uh, the link, and it all leapt into life. And I got about 40 meg, and... Um, uh, all was well, and that should have been the end of the story. Unfortunately, of course, I'd been involving my neighbours in a lot of this, and they'd been helping me, and you can guess where this is going. They were stuck on one or one and a half megs, and they actually realised that they wanted some of this high-speed internet. So I rang up Adrian Kennard, Andrews and Arnold, and uh, said, look, can I, can I resell the service that I've just bought from you? And he said, yep, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so he gave me his official blessing to do that. Uh, <laughs> and um, <clears throat> so I bought a Microtik router. Uh, a lot of people on IRC were raving about them at the time, so I took their, I took their advice. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I hooked it up, and it, it all worked. Uh, one of my neighbours, John, who'd been helping me with all the initial testing, uh, he was a dab ham with MySQL, and he wrote uh, a fairly rudimentary billing system uh, so that we could apportion uh, AAISP's usage charges accordingly. Um, at this point, I think it was probably quite trusting of me to get one of my customers to write my billing code. Uh, but at this point, beggars couldn't be choosers. So in any way, we initially booked a butchered a, a pair of Linksys routers uh, from my garage over to his garage, and I buried an Ethernet cable under the front lawn across to my next-door neighbour's house. 
Uh, that was our first Ethernet tale, and it still is. Um, so there were three of us uh, now on this, on this internet service, but unfortunately word spread. Uh, so the idea was mooted that we could get a few more folks connected, um, especially people in the Basingstoke broadband campaign that I've been talking to. So um, because I live at the top of a hill and I, I've got a pretty good view of Basingstoke, um, my neighbour and I put these antennas up on the side of my house and uh, there were a couple of ubi ubiquity um, access points. Um, and we covered most of Hatch Warren, which is the area that I live in. And uh, one thing spread, word spread, and one thing led to another. And uh, the Basingstoke Broadband Campaign people were the first people that I got to actually sign up to this service. They put their money where their mouths had been. And we got about uh, 40 customers. And uh, by this time, we thought we probably ought to have a name, so we coined it High Wi-Fi. Um, right, uh, where, where was I? Yes, so how much did this cost to get me going, since I'm uh, sort of vaguely on the subject of a shoestring? Well, the router was £100, a uh, couple of ubiquity access points, around 250 But uh, with the installation costs and the microwave link to Dave's house, it was around £700. There was probably a lot more money spent on beer and all sorts of other planning tools that we needed, but um, that's, that's the long and short of it. Um, and for each customer we added, it was around £145. Now, uh, as a result of the Basingstoke broadband campaign, we actually got uh, quite a lot more cabinets deployed, um, and we managed to get fibre to the cabinet directly to my house then, which gave me some advantages because I had diverse feeds from two different fibre to the cabinet uh, PCPs. And I was glad I did because uh, that summer, um, unfortunately, a drunk driver drove straight into uh, one of the cabinets. Fortunately, it wasn't either of the cabinets that was feeding me, but it could have been. Uh, and I, I, I'm looking at Neil here. He probably gets quite a lot of this sort of thing in, in BT, so no, but uh, it, it must happen. So uh, after that, uh, we went further afield, shall we say. Um, I uh, appeared on the council's radar screen, and in about 2013, I got invited to a country landowners association meeting in Winchester, now, at this point, I didn't even know it existed, the Country Landowners Association, but I got invited to talk about the thorny topic of rural broadband in Hampshire. And Bill Murphy of BT was there, as was my MP, Maria Miller, who at the time was Media for Culture and Sport. Um, now, from my memory, the meeting didn't go particularly well for either of them. There was quite a lot of antagonism from the audience, uh, but the lunch was good. Uh, and uh, being a member of the Awkward Squad, I asked a couple of questions from the floor. And after the meeting, a farmer and his wife came up to me and told me a tale of woe. Basically, uh, he got a lot of farm units that he was converting into industrial units, and he was having problems letting some of these units out simply because they couldn't get telephone lines and broadband to them. There was word on the street that one particular customer had been quoted £12,000 to have one copper line installed, and that was on about an eight-and-a-half or nine-kilometre link, link from the exchange. And could I help? So we hummed and hard, and I, he, he showed me where his farm was, and we looked at Google Maps, and I very quickly came to the conclusion that, no, I couldn't help because there was a hill in the way. The farmer was way ahead of me on this one, because he said, that's not a problem, that's my hill. Why not put a repeater on it? So, uh, we did. We sent, uh, I sent my son up a cherry picker, that's above a cow shed, and it doesn't take much imagination to realise what's on the ground beneath the cherry picker. Uh, and uh, he went up and we did some line of sight tests. Uh, that's my wife, uh, who helps me with the business, um, doing some more tests. Now, farmers are great because what happens is they've got cherry pickers, they've got chainsaws, uh, they've got land rovers to pull me out of ditches and, and, uh, and fields when I get stuck in them. Yes, I did get stuck in a field. Um, so it was all good. And eventually, our repeater went on uh, the house at the top of the hill that belongs to the farmer's niece. And that's the farmhouse. 
and that has a bird's eye view of the whole of the farm's industrial units. So we could provide broadband to them. So it was all good. Uh, we had the farm hooked up, we had the farmhouse, the farm workers, and we also had a collection of small businesses on the farms that were now signing up left, right, and centre. Unfortunately, word spread. Uh, <laughs> The, there was, um, next to the farm, there was a landowner on a 1,000 acres of estate. He had a very large house, lovely house, actually. Um, but he was getting really fed up in his home cinema watching Netflix on two rather lumpy satellite connections. So we did another survey. And we went to the top of the hill between the two. And we found that uh, we needed to put a post just about on the border between the farmer's land and uh, the estate. Um, but fortunately, we found one that was already there. Uh, and here you can see a, a perfectly positioned tree that we used to, uh, config to install our repeater on. Uh, you can see uh, the... the uh, how do I get a laser on this thing if I press that? Yes, you can see at the top we've got a, a sector antenna painted brown pointing towards... Uh, the thousand acre estate and there's in fact quite a few houses on that estate and then a back hall pointing back to the house. So a little bit of anatomy on our tree Peter. We've got some backup batteries that when the batteries are new they lasted about four to six hours. A little 24 volt UPS. Uh, we've got a Raspberry Pi in there hiding away that we use for monitoring the UPS and just pinging and making sure that everything's alive. And we've got a little microtic router in there that, that does the PPPOE session management and uh, uh, also provides power over Ethernet to the aerials. Uh, we use some deer-proof uh, armoured cable because uh, we didn't really want the, uh, the cables to get eaten by the deer. Um, right, the cost of a tree, Peter. Uh, I reckon it was around £2,000 for the whole thing. Uh, once we'd installed it, obviously uh, the landowner wanted to make sure that this, this contraption actually worked and delivered his broadband, so we let it run for a couple of months, changing car batteries on a fairly regular basis. And once he'd decided that all was good, he spent seven and a half grand running mains power from his house up across a ploughed field up to the tree. Uh, so it was quite an expensive installation for him. Uh, so... That's where we are, well, uh, that's where we are at the moment. The current status is that we've got around 130 customers across the network. Um, it's a good mix of business and residential, which is really helpful for uh, managing our daytime and evening load. Um, every customer has a static V4 and a slash 48 of V6 space, and we do uh, individual authentication using PPPoE and Radius. Um, our infrastructure is um, somewhat informal. Uh, we have 100 megabit Ethernet EAD from M247 and an Ethernet over FTTC from Andrews and Arnold. Um, and we have a backup FTTC also at the other location so that um, we've got some diversity. We've got, uh, it was 13, it's now 14 access points on the network and each has a little router, an RB750 Microtik uh, running PPPoE. We've got a fully V6-enabled network, and um, we use uh, OSPF across all the access points. Uh, all our cores are, and border routers are microtic. Uh, they're cheap and, cheap and cheerful, and they do the job. Um, monitoring and management, Nagios, it's all the usual suspects. We've started using Libra NMS. Uh, it's an amazing bit of kit, a uh, bit of software that's free, and it, it, it really is very good for monitoring um, historical uh, and detailed stats on, on all the lines. We use Smoke Ping to look at, make sure all our backhaul capacities are good. And there's a couple of proprietary tools that we use for monitoring the wireless and the Microtik routers. And we back up nightly to oxidized and backup PC and things like that. So, future plans. Uh, we're uh, planning to expand our backhaul. We're starting to put our capacity into telehouse now. Uh, the two new, new routers are there, a couple of CCR 1036s, and uh, we're getting a new giggy circuit from telehouse to the garage, and then we can upgrade the backhauls. 
and we're going to start rolling out some better capacity. Uh, and we've got a few other plans in, in the pipeline as well. So uh, that, in a nutshell, is how to start an ISP by accident. Any questions? <laughs> Ah, uh, I was afraid. I Hello, Neil. I love these self-builds. Self it takes me back to my demon days. Um, the, um, the tree PR, yes. when did you do that? Uh, about three years ago, something like that. I can't remember the time scales. Who's the sound guy? Oh, there oh, you go. There we yes. Go. The tree Peter. So, um, when, when did we start yeah. that? I think it was about 2013, something like that. And, and did you have any problems with the trees growing? Well, fortunately, it was a perfectly constructed tree for the purpose. Um, it, it actually it uh, all, didn't the, grow. <laughs> <laughs> all the branches were on one side, right. so um, it really isn't a problem because th there's almost no foliage on the. I don't know if you. I don't know if I can go back to it. It looked like it looked like it was winter. That's why I was asking. Yeah, you can see it, it was winter when we did it, but you, you can see that um, all the branches kind of come out on one side. Okay. Um, and um, there was one time when the, when the wind blew one of our dishes off alignment, but that was just because my aerial guy wasn't very didn't, didn't tighten it up terribly well, so we had to come and sort that out. But. Which actually links me to, to a couple of other questions. The, the, um, one is health and safety. Putting all these aerials up is so a kind of thing that freaks us out. Um, kind of what, what challenge do you have with that? And also, why are you using PPP over E for this rather than VLANs or just plain old Ethernet? Um, Hist hist history, really. It was easy to set up. Uh, it means that we can use internal IP addresses across our network, because we, uh, so we route our public IPs over internal IP addresses, and we use OSPF to bring up uh, the routes across the network. So it's fairly kind of... Uh, um, for, that's the reason. For how many end users? 130 at the moment. I mean, I, I, just an advice, I would, I would try and simplify that. I mean, I, if I could turn OSP off... OSPF off in my network, I would do it tomorrow. Um, it's horrific. And and, um, and and the PPPoE, just, uh, just uh, the most complex device we have in the network are PPP servers. Mm. And again, I'm working to kill them all because um, they, they just cause nothing but trouble. So uh, just some advice as you, uh, you, know, Thank you. Ex expand, consider that. Thanks, but, Neil. But a great project. Thank you. Any other questions? Same. Yes. It's not quite a question. I was going to tell Neil that the trick is to put the dishes on similar trees, same species. <laughs> I, I, your, your talk was very interesting because you've just told me my history for the last six weeks. Oh, like, I've even got exactly the same metal box that you've got on your there, there are Schneider box on yeah. mine in, in Devon. And I was just going to say, if there are people here doing what you're doing and doing what I'm doing, Perhaps we should get together and have a chat. I think, I think, I think that would be very, very good, yes. It's always good to get a group of uh, like-minded wisps in, in one room together. You can get um, me at steve at inovi.com. Catch me afterwards. I'll, I'll take your address. Thank you. That's great. Okay, one more question. Uh, Greg Chills from 3. Um, going back to um, a very long ago, previous existence, beware bur burying cables under lawns. Um, I used to work at a place where we buried cables under the lawns and one day there was a lightning strike and the piece of equipment on the end actually caught fire. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anything else? Good. Okay, thank right. you, Tim. Thank you.